You may be seated. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Well, as I said, surprise. <laughs> I'm the speaker today. So just bear with me today. I believe there's something that I can share with you today. My husband just is so disappointed that he couldn't be here. And then he wanted to be at the fellowship group tonight. But, you know, when that cough starts, you just, you don't want to be coughing on anybody. So anyway, anyway, I'm standing under him tonight, today to speak. Amen. I'm not the preacher. I'm just going to teach you a few things that maybe would be helpful. So I want to turn to 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, and I want to call this subject that I'm going to talk about today, the rare jewel of contentment. Say that word with me, contentment. The rare jewel of contentment. 1 Timothy 6.6 6 says this, but godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we will carry nothing out amen we got to keep that in our subconscious in our mind in our heart to remember that godliness with contentment is gain all the thing the uh, things of this world that we put our hope and build up to something so big when we die it's all going to be left behind amen amen thank you sister krista so this this contentment that i want to speak to you about today where where can we find this where can we find this rare treasure of godliness with, with contentment in these days that we live we are tempted aren't we so often to complain to grumble, to gripe, to be discontent about life. Always. We could have a Holy Ghost prayer meeting and get up from that and go out those doors and face something. All of a sudden get slapped in the face with something that just knocks you upside the head. And all of a sudden, where was that? where's all that Holy Ghost prayer meeting that you just had, right? Where's all that joy and peace and, and rest in the Holy Ghost? All of a sudden, we're faced with life when we walk out these doors. And if you're human as we are, then we realize we leave church or we get up from prayer, as I just said, and we have to go outside and live real life. Right, Brother Arnold? We've got to go outside and live real life. Amen. Thank the Lord. He's with us in this real life. We don't have to be alone in it, but sometimes we do feel alone because of things we go through. And you know, I tell this about my grandparents. I've thought about them so many times in my life when I was younger and the example that they were to me. They pastored a Pentecostal, apostolic Pentecostal oneness church in Bedford, Indiana. And I've had the opportunity to go back uh, several times in the last several years and it just it just did something for me in my spirit to be able to go back. The place that I received the Holy Ghost, the little, little church there in Bedford, Indiana, but it just brought so many memories back. But they pastored this church. Old-fashioned, down in the basement, they had to go prayer meeting. Well, nothing fancy. They received the Holy Ghost in the 1940s. This is when the latter rain movement kind of started. And they attended many prayer meetings after that. After they were filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name, they were prayed many prayer meetings, sometimes nightly, every day, prayer meetings. They were so excited about God and that Holy Ghost power in their lives. They had to testify. They had to tell people, invite them to a prayer meeting. It wasn't just inviting them to church. Come with me to prayer meeting. God's moving, you know. I received the Holy Ghost. So, you know, I got to thinking about that. Lord, what would it be? I wonder what God would do if we had more Holy Ghost prayer than just church services. If we had more Holy Ghost moving in our midst, Holy Ghost filled people really getting an overflow in their lives like they did, I wonder what God would do for us. I wonder if he wouldn't start filling the house instead of just our expectations assuming the way it's going to be. 
But God began to move in a way that we can't even imagine or expect what he would do. Amen? I wonder what it would be like. I, sp I spent time with my grandparents in my teens. I was 13 year old, years old when I received the Holy Ghost. And I spent about a year with my grandparents in my teens. And I watched them daily, sacrifice, spent time visiting the sick, praying for people, revival services that they had. Listen at this, saints of God. Praying for people, revivals that went on in their church went on for weeks at a time. Sometimes it could be a month or two. As the Lord moved, they, they felt whether they should continue or go. But they were being led by the Spirit weeks at a time. And you know how many times they came to church? Every night. Every night. Every night they came to church. Oh, my. That's overwhelming for us these days, isn't it? And believe me, they had children. My grandparents had 12 or 13 children all together. 13 children. And they had children. But you know what? They didn't let it stop them. They prayed, and they had revival, and a lot of it was prayer. People prayed through to the Holy Ghost at the altar. They repented. I mean, they walked up from there. They threw their alcohol out. They threw their cigarettes out. They threw whatever was they were addicted to out, and they were changed when they got up from that altar and filled with the Holy Ghost. These are my experiences as a young person seeing my grandparents in this. So it made me a believer. It made me a believer in the Holy Ghost power. We don't stay the same when we get up from the altar. If we're filled with the Holy Ghost, we don't remain the same. God changes us. He gives us a new heart. He gives us a new desire. The things we once loved, we hate now. Amen. So, <clears throat> so my grandfather also, with these revivals, worked at a limestone mill. Do you know what a limestone mill is? It's hard work digging out that limestone out of the, out of the hills. He went to work at 4.30 in the morning and came home just to eat a little bit of something. Some days was fasting all day after all that hard work. And just to get to church, had enough time to hurry and get a little bite, clean up, get to church. Now, this is the sacrifice. They were serious. They were serious about living for God and, and doing what God wanted them to do. There were no breaks. There were no breaks for them. Just prayer. That was where they found their relief. That's where they found their joy. That's where they found their strength. Preaching and revival going on continually. People sometimes, listen at this, were in the altars till midnight. These are the things that my grandparents sacrificed when they had to get up so early in the morning, but yet they stayed at that altar because they were serious about praying somebody through to the Holy Ghost. They wanted them to be a believer and understand that God is real and they don't have to remain the same, but God is a deliverer. You know, again, we're talking about godliness and contentment. Now, you'd think that contentment and like the hard life that they had to live, how could they be content with so much pressure? How did they do it? I look back and think, how did they do it? But, you know, I can testify to this. I never heard them complaining. I heard them sometimes my grandma would go, oh, Jesus, because it was a weariness because she had to work hard. There were no modern conveniences, amen, for, for women in those days. And so she just a sigh of weariness. And grandpa, he would walk and be praying throughout the day when he'd get home there in the house. And I'd hear him, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I mean, that was, that was his conversation, just a breath of prayer continually. And, you know, I look back on those memories now. I know everybody doesn't have a memory of, of growing up in church. And as I said, I was 13 when I, because I really wasn't raised in the church. We lived in California. My dad was in the Navy, so we weren't raised around my grandparents. But the times that we did, I, I was so impacted, so impacted by their example. And I tried to figure out, Lord, how in the world could they do all these things and be so dedicated and committed, even with all their responsibilities? And now I understand that they settled a question. They settled a question with God of why. They settled that question with God. Why? 
why so much su and they went through a lot of suffering they went through a lot of hardships they were not rich they were very struggling in their financial just getting by the lord provided but they settled that question they never asked god why why do i have to go through this why can't things be better why do does that have to happen or this have to happen they settled that question with God. They got the Holy Ghost. They got committed to God, and they settled that question with him and never looked back. Did you hear me? They never looked back. They did not have the question, well, I'm just having a hard time now, and, you know, this is just too hard. I can't do all this sacrifice for the church, and God, you know, I just need to get home and get my rest. And No, they, they settled that question of why. They never looked back. It was God pursuing God. Because you know why? They were sold out. They were sold out. Now, I'm talking about contentment here today. They were sold out to God's will, and whatever sacrifice was needed, it was with a made-up mind. We've got to have a made-up mind in serving God because the enemy is going to come in and destroy you if you do not make up your mind that no matter what, I am going to serve God. They made up their mind. They endured. They experienced a peace of God that came with their calling to the Lord's work in their lives. If we, saints of God, are going to have godliness with contentment, we are also going to have to settle some things in our hearts and spirits. First of all, to know that godliness with contentment means that we are trusting God with all the whys of our life. We have got to trust God with the whys because you may never get an answer for all the whys. You may never. Some things are extremely difficult. And these are the whys of God. Maybe we're never going to get an answer except God says, trust me. Trust me. The whys of life saints of God. I just pray some of this will help you today. The whys of life will get us in discontentment, and that's the opposite of contentment. They'll get us in complaining and grumbling about every day that we wake up, that things are not the way we want them to be, that we're not happy about the way things are. Now, remember, contentment is not, I'm not talking about happiness. I'm talking about contentment. Because happiness doesn't mean we're always going to be happy in life because things happen that frustrate us, right? But I'm talking about contentment, a lasting contentment that God gives us, that we settle the whys with God. And we stop the grumbling, we stop the complaining, we stop the frustration of blaming others and blaming God and blaming life, you know. Oh, I just, you know. There are seasons in our lives. Do we all know that? Just like in, in nature, there are seasons. There are seasons in our lives and trusting the process of the way that God is working. We've got to understand that. We go through seasons. We're not always on the mountain when we serve God. Probably more so in the valleys, right? More so in the struggles and in the temptations and the things that come against us to try to cause us to waver in our walk, spiritual walk with him. There are seasons of life, and we have got to settle with God that he is working a process through the seasons in our life. Amen? God's perspective is different from our human perspective. It's different. He thinks above us, beyond. Amen? All wisdom is in God. If we have questions, we've got to take it to God in prayer and leave it with him. We've got to leave the whys and the things that we're going through. We've got to bring it to the altar. We've got to leave it with him and leave it there, not pick it back up and say, well, I think I can take care of this, God. No, you just brought it to the altar. Leave it with him. Stop questioning him. You're going through seasons, and he's going to bring you to another season, but you've got to be patient in the waiting, right? We've got to be patient in the waiting on God and find a contentment in him no matter what. God so often will have us wait for him in our prayers for the answers. And that is where in our human 
reasoning, we have such a difficulty because, Lord, you said if we ask and believe, it shall be done. Now, it, his word says that. It shall be done. We can speak to the mountain. Be thou moved. Cast in the sea, and it shall be done. But again, it doesn't say a time frame of that. It doesn't give us a time frame sometimes to speak to things, to, to speak life, to speak salvation to family members, or to, to w- let God work in his timing, because God's timing is different than ours. We want it now, right? Come on, God. I've been praying about this. Where are you now? Come on. I'm getting tired of waiting, right? Do your kids do that to you? Mom, Dad, you know, I'm, ti- I'm tired. I want now. It's like, oh, boy. Got to work on that attitude, right? And I just call it an attitude. Attitude. We get, we get toods, don't we? Oh, Lord, help us. Help us, Jesus, to have patience with you, to trust your timing and all things. He's patient with us, right? So, Lord, help us. Help us to have a contentment that gives us patience, that we trust that you are working in the seasons of our life, and you will bring us to a new season. Amen. We say, God, I just don't like this. I don't like this waiting. And then we try to bargain with God. Lord, I'm faithful. I'm faithful to church, and I'm a giver, and I show up at church, and I help people, and I do all these things, God. Look at me. And sometimes we just try to bargain with God with our good works. Good works is not going to save us. I mean, it's good to do all those things. But again, those works are not what's going to save you. And we start saying, why? Why? We think surely God should explain himself, right? We're faithful children of God. God should be explaining himself to me why I'm not getting an answer. You ever feel like that? To learn contentment, we have to move from our sobs of doubt and resolve ourselves to wait. So we can pray, we can have that burden, we pour it out to God, we get up and wipe our tears, and then we have a resolve because we've just left it with God. We're going to wait on you. We're going to trust you, Lord. In the dark, if necessary, if I don't get a word, if I don't get an answer, Whatever it is that you allow me to go through or this season, Lord, you're trying to teach me something through it. So I resolve to wait on you until your timing, until you answer. And though we never understand some things we're never going to understand, we trust him for the outcome. Though, 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 yet I will trust him. Say that with me. I will trust him. I will trust him. Job said this in 1315 of Job. Though he slay me, there's those though, 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 though. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. And I will keep my integrity with God. Oh, how important that is to keep our integrity with God when we're going through dry seasons, through dark times, through times when we don't get that answer, times when we're not really feeling real spiritual, right? Amen. We are to keep our integrity with God. We don't start talking down in the mouth about God or the church or others or or about our walk with him. I'm just getting tired of this, and I'm just tired of that one, and I'm just tired. Of, you know, we just get down in our spirit, and our mouth just runs too much. We say, say more than we should. Amen. And then we got to go back and, oh, Lord, forgive me. I shouldn't have said that. Lord, help me, Lord. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit with me, in me. Through prosperities and times of, of adversity, we settle. We will trust him. We must shift our eyes from our circumstances to a sovereign God. Amen? That is the blessed controller of all things. Why do we think we have control of everything? My goodness, we take on so much responsibility trying to control people, trying to control situations, trying to... Rather than take it to God and, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom, Lord. 
He's the blessed controller of all things. We've got to get something deep down, saints of God. We've got to get something deep down on the inside that carries us through when we don't know what to do, when we don't see what's going on, when our disappointments become so great that we are exhausted. Have you ever been exhausted from the burden of things that you're going through? We get exhausted in our bodies and our spirits. My contentment, our contentment is not in my circumstances, as I said, because they all aren't what we like and what we feel happy about. Yet I will trust the God who is my strength. When we are exhausted for burdens and circumstance, I want to encourage you today, settle in your heart and your mind, I will trust the Lord who is my strength. Are you exhausted today? Trust the Lord. Look up to him. Receive strength from him in prayer. Find a place where you just pour it out to him and let him refresh your spirit today. Contentment happens on the inside. It's something on the inside. It is a soul sufficiency beyond feelings and beyond people. You think, well, if you have contentment, then you have to feel it. It's not an emotional thing. It's not feeling. Contentment is something on the inside. It's a state of the heart. It's where our heart is, not a state of affairs. Amen? It's a state of where our heart is. Do we wonder why? There is so much discontentment in the times that we live. Look at what we deal with every day when we walk out these doors. The jobs that you have to work on, the stress, the hours that you have to put in. Amen. Your strength level is depleted. And we walk out these doors. When's the last time you've run into somebody or just even talked to somebody in the church and had a conversation? Wow. You say, how, things are go how are things going with you? When's the last time you talked to somebody and they said, oh, I am so content. I feel so much contentment. I am so just full of joy because I am so content. When's the last time you had a conversation with anybody? It's, it's been quite a while. Usually when you say how things are going, it's usually the list of all the things that aren't going right. <laughs> right? You know I'm saying the truth. Discontentment in the times that we go out in this world, living in the world, but not of the world. We're not of the world. We're not of their way of thinking, of their way of behavior and actions. We don't, we don't do those things anymore because God's changed us, right? At our altar of repentance, we're changed. We have a changed heart. And we go out into this world and have to deal with all of the people that don't think it like us, Right? And that's okay because they're, lo they're lost, and, and we need to be a witness and a light. Amen to them. We need to be an example of God's love and God's, God's goodness to them that they may desire something that we have, right? We're to be, go out and tell them to be a witness. But we go out and face this world every day, and I'm just telling you, life is hard. I told this story of some women uh, in prison, and, and uh, there was a, a minister lady that went to visit them and she was give, to give a talk that day in the pr women's prison and she stood up and she said she doesn't know what came upon her she was so nervous to get up and speak to these women what could she say and she said all of a sudden she blurted out and she said life is hard and then you die and so she said when she said that all the women in the prison stood up and just clapped their hands she had a standing <laughs> standing ovation. Life is hard and then you die. So it's like, it is. But you know what? God is still good in the process of everything, of the hardness of life, the hardships of life. Paul went through it too, but you know what? He was secure in God. He had a settled contentment in his heart. He quit asking why, and he served God with contentment. Amen? 2 Timothy 3, 1 Verse 5 explains very well what we will be seeing in these last days. When we go out there, read 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 5. 
It explains what we're going to be seeing. When we look around and see a world that has gone mad, and I say mad, the worldly view and culture these days is mad. There's nothing about God or the Bible and a foundation for young people's lives anymore. We read the Bible, and right before our eyes, 2 Timothy 3.1, we see these very things spoken in the Word of God of what we're going to see in these last days. It says this, know also that in the last days, perilous, perilous, troublesome times are going to come. So why are we surprised? Why are we surprised when we hear the news or see the news and hear all the things going on? And I know we don't like to focus on that because the Lord is greater. But at the same time, we face it every day, and it's exhausting. It drains us. We don't find anything in this scripture that the, the, what's going to be going on the wor in the world is godliness and contentment, do we? Anywhere in this explanation in 2 Timothy talking about what's going to be going on, Paul says it's the day of perilous times that men are going to be lovers of themselves. Do we see that? Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, or I would say to authority, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. We must turn away. Turn away from that type of thinking and mindset. So obviously, this explanation in 2 Timothy there will be some Christian people also in this last verse, a form of godliness, but denying the power. This explanation, there's going to be some Christians in this mix in the last days. They say they're Christians. They put on a show of being a Christian, but in their heart, they are not Christians. They don't behave like Christians. They don't act like Christians. And so there's going to be these. And it says, it says, even false prophets in these last days, and there's false prophets in pulpits today in churches. False prophets, they will even be able to call fire down from heaven in the last days. And so people are going to run to the glitter and the bling and, and where all the things that people say, oh, if you do this or if you give this much money or if you do this or do that, then you're going to, you know, this is going to save you. And they're caught up in, in just a show not the true glory of God and the true power of God, but it is a show. It is a, a pleasing of their flesh. And that's why so many people flock to these churches. Matthew 7, 23 says this. When Jesus says about, about these kind of people and this what's going on, he said, and then I will profess unto those false prophets, those people that proclaim Christianity, but they don't live it. I never knew, he said, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Wow. That, that's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? He said, in the last days, in the last days, this is what he's going to say. I never knew you. Depart from me. So I want to be sincere. I want to have contentment with God. I want to have a walk with God that it is sure that I am not shaken by all of the false things that other people say Christianity is, and I know for a fact it isn't because of the experience that I've had with God, my experience with my grandparents of the sacrifice, amen, of the experience of knowing God and his power, but also in his suffering, amen, that mean we may walk with him and be more like him. So our desire of contentment is needing to draw closer to God. Closer to God in these troublesome times. We must, saints of God, pursue that rare jewel of godliness with contentment in our lives. It's the only thing that is going to last. We must portray an attitude, again, back to that attitude of heart and behavior, of true godliness and show that in the way we handle life before others. Did you know that's your biggest witness? It's not the words you say but it's the way you live your life before others, your example to others, amen? When they see you go off and cuss and, 
and, and do all kinds of things in your behavior when you get angry and frustrated? What kind of witness is that as a Christian to the, to the lost? They do that. They don't want that kind of Christianity if they're serious. Brother Harvey, a couple weeks ago on Mother's Day, he said this, the fruit of the Spirit, if we're going to have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, it's not about us, it's about others. It's going out there letting others see the fruit of the Spirit and wanting that, right? Wanting to take some of that fruit out of our lives. Amen. And he said, if we have gifts that God gives us, it's not, the gifts are not for us, it's for others to bless others with, right? Amen. Amen. And I believe that. Apostle Paul is instructing Timothy in this second chapter that we just read about what true godliness is. He says, a good soldier doesn't entangle himself in the cares of this life. Wow. We need to be reminded of this, saints of God. We don't need to entangle ourselves with all kinds of worldly things and be caught up in that because we can be lost in the end because we love this world so much. We don't pursue God like we should. He explains in this second chapter of Timothy that it's not a means to financial gain what we do for the Lord. As many teachers in many churches have made this a doctrine regarding financial gain. If you give this much money, you'll get a, I don't know, what, Lamborghini. or It used to be a Cadillac. We've come up in times and what people want, a Lamborghini, or if you give this much money, you'll get this, and you'll do this, and you'll get this blessing, and it's like, that's man, that's, that's man's word. If God moves on you to give a certain amount or whatever, now we believe in tithes and offerings, that's scriptural, but, but it's just a lot of teachers and preachers and pulpits these days, they get people out of a spirit of contentment because they want all these worldly things. That's not what God's kingdom is about. He may bless you with some worldly things, but we use it. We don't, we don't uh, love it, right? Rarely do we hear, hear the word contentment anymore. Like I said, we haven't had a conversation with many lately. Why is that? That inwardly fleshly nature. Our nature wants to believe that we can figure it out ourselves. God, I can, I can do this. I can do this. And he's just looking at us, just shaking his head. Oh, my, you've got some lessons to learn. The drive, the drive is out there for competition, but God's word never tells us to compete or compare, right? God's word doesn't tell us to compete or compare, but to run the race with what? Patience. There's that word again. Oh, my, we don't like that word. Patience. Not as a fast sprinter, not somebody that's just goes for it all from the very beginning. That's not, not the way marathon runners run. We are to run with patience the race that is set before us. We've got our pace ourselves in, in our walk with God. We aren't always, as I said, up in this Holy Ghost move. Sometimes it's prayer. It's waiting on God, reading his word. Sometimes it's silence, just listening for God's voice. Amen. We don't... We don't run as a fast sprinter, but we learn how to trust God and wait on him again for the outcome and steady our pace with God. Discontentment is usually about getting more or achieving more, even if it means not really praying about what, we're, what we are discontent about. Success, success is not about most of the time what we think it's about because we compare because we compare with others. Success, God's word tells us, is the opposite of what the world tells us to do to succeed. His word tells us to be discreet and take account of what we have, what he's blessed us with, and to lay up our treasures. Where? In heaven. He tells us not to desire and pursue Material things in a way that we can't live without them. If you lost, let me ask you this today regarding contentment. If you lost everything you had, would Jesus be enough in your life? Would he be enough? And we are so blessed with material things and financial. We're blessed. But if you lost it all, and for some reason that we wouldn't understand, it was all taken from you, would Jesus be enough? I want to ask you that. Think about that. Would Jesus be enough? 
the opposite. God tells us the opposite of success of what the world tells us. His word tells us to be discreet and don't hold on to things with a grip, things, material things, but you have to realize they're all going to pass away. But what you lay up in heaven, it says it will never pass away. Jesus said this in Philippians 4, 11, 12, that we would get rich in serving him, but we are warned. Jesus never said that we would get rich in serving him. But he warned in Philippians 4, 11, and 12. He said this, we are told to flee from the eagerness to get rich and that we are to pursue righteousness, godliness, again, there's that word, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. This is success right here when we pursue those things. If God blesses our finances, saints of God, in the midst of living for him and serving him, and he does, he blesses us. As I said, when we give, he gives back. But if God blesses our finances in the midst of all this pursuit of him, then we say, thank you, Lord, right? Thank you, Lord, if he blesses us, that we can turn around and continue to give. But we don't, we don't love it. We don't love Money, the love of money, it says, is the root of all evil, the love of it. Not using it and being blessed with it to help others, to give. It's not to hoard upon ourselves at all. We realize there has never been a time that godliness with contentment is more needed in our lives and in the body of Christ. Amen? I think this is the biggest problem in churches today of why people don't stick. They don't stay. They don't get rooted in God. They don't pursue godliness content with contentment because they, they, they look around. They're looking around at everything else instead of pursuing God. And, and eventually, they, they are uprooted. They, they leave because their roots aren't down deep. We realize that this is the time that we must pursue God like we've never done. Learning to be content with God has given us instead of being unhappy because we don't have what we want is something we need to be reminded of to be content with God instead of walk always going around being discontent with because we're not happy. We don't have everything the way we want it. This did discontentment also. Married couples can bleed over into our marriages. That's why women... A lot of times they're discontent, they're unhappy in their marriage, they get caught up in romance novels and soap operas, I don't even know, I don't really watch TV, but I guess there may be soap operas still, <laughs> that was an old thing, but sometimes women, they get, get discontent, and so they get caught up in, in love novels, romance novels, and soap operas, and, and then it shows up in our friendships with others, peer pressure can lead to discontent because we're comparing again. So we get in this peer pressure mode and, and unhappy. And men also can get lured toward flirtatious women and pornography from discontentment. We're trying to serve God, but again, we haven't settled some things in our heart. And, and men can get caught up in some of these things, temptations because they haven't settled in their heart and get contentment and godliness in there. Also, our financial woes can cause us to be discontent and begin to be jealous of others. Have you ever heard of keeping up with the Joneses? That pressure's out there if we keep our eyes out there. Then lastly, our physical situations that we as God's people deal with in everyday life. Sometimes we are experiencing illness or sudden diagnosis where we feel that God has forgotten us and is not fair. Disappointment and ungratefulness come to us all at times. But in these days, rarely do we get what we want, right? Rarely, rarely do we get what we want. And what we set our minds on. When is the last time you just said no to yourself? That you didn't need that certain something and that you tell yourself, you have enough. When's the last time you said that? Because even as Christians, sometimes we have become so dependent on credit cards and overextending ourselves. 
rather than wait, pray for God's direction and be content oftentimes. We are impatient and want something so bad. Years ago, my grandparents didn't have this ability, but we just can pull out a credit card, right, and get it anyway, even if we don't, you know, we didn't pray about it, and, you know, God didn't really say yes or no, but we just go do it. And maybe we could have done without that thing, but we start charging up the credit cards. It's so easy to get caught up with a faulty focus, amen, that there's never enough. Have you ever said that? There's never enough. There's just never enough. I'm so tired. I work so hard. There's never enough. <laughs> Maybe from a current concern perspective, you've said that. And maybe you feel like, well, I'm trying to figure out how am I going to be able to cover all of our needs, especially financial. And that's understandable. We've all been in those places. But the opposite, again, of contentment is discontentment. That constant nagging feeling inside that we want more. We have to have more. It has to be more. It has to be bigger. It has to be better. The feeling of what we have is not enough when it comes to material things. Again, we love those material things. Emmanuel Kant said this, give a man everything he wants, and at that moment he gets everything he wants. It will not be everything. That's our human nature, right? Never enough. We've achieved this. Now we've got to get this. And now we've got to get this. And so it's ne enough is never enough in, our fle in the fleshly realm. Ima uh, when we look for a contentment in material possessions, the things we want can pull us deeper and deeper into discontentment in life. That which we want becomes that which we belong to. Let me say that again. That which we want becomes that which we belong to. So our pursuit of material things compared to our pursuit of God, who do we want to belong to? This world and material things to the place that we love it so much, God's in the background, or do we pursue God? And whatever God blesses, blesses us, as we say thank you. But it's not our love. Our love is God. Our love is to him. Our heart is settled. We have to get a second job sometimes to pay for things, material things. So our attendance to church is threatened. And it's like a vice grip that's hard to let go of. We know that this need for, that, for more and not having enough started in the Garden of Eden with Eve. She was deceived by Lucifer. That somehow she believed that God was holding out on her because Lucifer told her that. Did God say that? You shall not die. God was holding out on her. God didn't really want, want her to have more. She believed that God really didn't, wasn't going to look out for her best, even though he created her. That's amazing. But that's the flesh. God was holding out and didn't really want her to have more. Little did Eve know that that spirit of greed and not trusting God and that he knew what was best for her would plague humanity for that moment of disobedience on. Think about that. Through every generation, how much that spirit of greed has taken a hold of so many, and it's in our government. It passed on through that sinful nature because of Adam and Eve disobeying God's, God's command in the garden. This spirit of greed and sinful nature is passed on. A.W. Tozier, Tozier said this, within the human heart, Things have taken over. God's gifts now take the place of God. And the whole course of nature is upset by the monstrous substitution. Wow. Pretty powerful statement. God's word tells us to use things and love people. Amen. Use things and love people. When we read in Psalm 139, 23 and 24... Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We must take account of our heart and where we are laying up our treasures. To be in control of our possessions and honoring God with them rather than them controlling us. That's why 2 Corinthians 10, 12 admonishes to not compare ourselves 
among ourselves because it's unwise. But to keep a heart of contentment and godliness that reigns over our possessions and heart's desires, we must go back to God's standard for living over our mindset and understanding. First of all, everything belongs to God. First Chronicles 29. It says this, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom you are exalted as head over all wealth and honor. Did you hear that? Wealth and honor come from you. It's not just you out there working. It says wealth and honor. God gives you the ability to have wealth and honor. You are the ruler, Lord, of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Everything comes from you, and we have been given only what comes from your hand. Amen? Amen. Second is our heart attitude, Psalm 62.10. Our heart attitude of discontentment is the issue. Psalm 62.10 says, Though our riches may increase, we are not to set our hearts on them. Amen? God has to be first. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, it says, We are to store up our treasures in heaven. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. Third, possessions are second to God, which means to be content with what we have. To be content with what we have. And if we feel we need more, then we pray and keep God in the center of our increase. Amen? We are not to take, make God. We are not to make God out of money. The scripture says the love of money is the root of all evil. Fourth, we must know the possessions are to be used and not loved. We've already talked about that. Luke 12, we are told to keep our lives free from the love of money and be content with what we have. One of Jesus, did you know that one of Jesus' most frightening warnings to the contemporary America was his rebuke of the rich landowner in Luke 12? The landowner continued to build bigger barns, and he said would, he would store up earthly treasures for years to come. And he told his soul, take thy knees. Look at all I've done. Look at all my wealth. He said, soul, just take thy knees. There was no place for God there. He was not putting God anywhere in this part of his life. It was all about his riches, his belongings, and the spirit of greed. There was never enough for him in his life. He thought life would but e was going to be easy, but God's judgment was sift, swift that night. His life was taken from him. God's warning was we must be on guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. When we pass from this earth, what will we be known for, saints of God? What will we be known for? When our life ends, our possessions or our deeds, our character, who we were, what we did, or will it just be all the wealth and possessions that we built up? I believe, I believe this as we grow older. God gives us wisdom through experience that's, experiences that we've had. And we haven't all been perfect, and we all haven't always made the right decision. But thank God for grace that God pulls us back in because we want to do what's right. We want to serve him. But it says um, that God gives us wisdom through experience, through our own mistakes and desire to help younger people. Younger people not fall into the trap of materialism and greed that comes by comparing yourself with someone else. You are you, and they are who they are. And God has a special plan for you, and you have to believe that. You have to settle that and do your best with what, with what God's called you to do. If we continue with a give me more men mentality, we won't remain content, right? It's true. We are happy for a time when we get what we want. But as I said, it's rare not to get what we want these days. 
because we have credit cards. But true godly contentment is about wanting what we have. Have you ever just woke up and say, thank you, Lord, for what I have? Instead of thinking ahead, well, I want more. I want the It's like, have you ever just woke up and say, thank you, Lord, for today, for what I have today? Your grace is for today. What I have today, Lord, I'm going to use things and love people. We must be on alert. A story is told, and I'm closing, if Sister Liz and Sister Chris, if you want to come up. A story is told of Satan's angels falling in their attempts to entice a godly woman into sin. They had tried the temptation of a handsome man. These were for the single ladies. And the promise of power and the promise of rewards. Nothing worked. Nothing worked. Satan told his agent, agents, the reason you have failed is that your methods are too crude for one who seeks God. So Satan approached the godly woman with great care and whispered in her ear, your best friend just received a million-dollar inheritance and bought the most beautiful house you've ever seen. All of a sudden, of being happy for her friend, a scowl formed on that woman's face over her mouth, and her eyes tightened with a look of greed. Satan had won and enticed her with greed, jealousy, and discontentment. There's that word. Psalm 119.14 says this. I will rejoice in following your statues at one, as one who rejoices in great riches. We are rich today, saints of God. We are rich in his power, in his grace, in his love. Why do we put all of our confidence in material things? We are rich in him. You go to these foreign countries, those people have nothing. But they act like they're rich because of the love of God in their life. Amen. Psalm 119, 36 says, Turn my heart, Lord, toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Psalm 16, 5 says, Lord, you alone are my inheritance. My cup of blessing, you guard all that is mine. Did you hear that? Keep that scripture. Psalm 16, 5 says, Lord, you alone, you alone are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard, he guards all that is mine. Amen. So what do we do? Do. What do we have to fret? Why do we have to fret and worry about things? Or be discontent about this morning when the Lord guards all that we have, all that is ours. Amen. Are you thankful for that today? That is his promise. Let's treasure the rare jewel of contentment in our serving God. Let us be the people that are grateful for what we have and let go of control of what we don't. To have a quiet heart, a peaceful heart that is content with what God gives us. Lord, help us. Help us to stop being so anxious and fretting over material things. When we begin to take account and take note of things we're grateful for, we will begin to lose sight of things that we lack, right? We realize we don't lack that much. We are blessed in America. One of Apostle Paul's amazing words in Philippians 4, 11, 13, he says, I am not saying this, and we know all the suffering that Paul went through. Go back and read all the books that he wrote. Amen. He says, I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned, Paul says, to be content whatever circumstances I am in. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. You may stand. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. The Greek word says for the one who makes me able 
Are we able today? Are we able, saints of God? Does God make us able today? There was a story of a con contented man in the kingdom. A king was suffering from a painful ailment and was told that the only cure for him was to find a contented man, get his shirt and wear it, and bring it back and wear it night and day. So the messengers were sent out through the kingdom to search for such a man that was content with orders, bring back his shirt. Months passed after a thorough search of the country, the messengers returned with the shirt, without the shirt, without the shirt. Did you find a contented man in all the realm? The king asked. Yes, O oh king, we found one, just one in all the realm. Then why did you not bring back his shirt? The servants answered, Master, the man had no shirt. That was the only contented man in the kingdom. Oh, saints of God, this morning, I, I pray something. I said I was a little lengthy, and I apologize. I know everybody's weary, tired, but you know what? I pray something that I spoke to you about, these scriptures that I gave you to, today, the rare jewel of contentment is such a need in our lives as Christians because you will fall out, you will lose out with God when you let this discontentment rule your life. When your life is run by material possessions and things, you will lose out with God and be lost in the end. Your love for God is of utmost importance, settling in your heart and mind that God is first and everything else will work out when you put God first in your life. Settle that heart with contentment in him. Let him be the guard over your things. He will make you able. He will provide your needs. He will be everything that you need. Hallelujah. Don't hold out on God. Don't hold out on church. Don't hold out on being together with the body of Christ. We encourage one another. We help one another through those dark times. That's what the body of Christ is all about. Amen. We need one another. We need God and we need one another today. As new people come in these doors, we want them to feel the love of God. We want them to see we are not perfect people, but, but we are people that trust God. We pray and we believe that God is the God that he says he is. He was the God that was and is and is to come and he will not fail. He will not change. He is faithful in our lives. Hallelujah. I've been serving God over 55 years now. And I can tell you I've been through difficult, dark, very hard times. Amen. And in many ways, in many ways, but I can tell you, I am not sorry that I've lived for God. I am not sorry that I made that decision. Lord, I don't want to rule myself. I want you to rule over me, God. I want you to be my God. I surrender to you. My life belongs to you, Lord. And I've never been sorry. I've never regretted that decision decision for you see my goal is heaven my goal is eternity and we're going to live in eternity somebody made a joke the other day and somebody was posting something on our church page and in our facebook page and it just out of the clear blue this person because uh, i was advertising or uh, promoting our bible study or or church, I forget what it was and all of a sudden said such a waste of time they posted such a waste of time because I was posting, bring your Bibles, and we want to study the Word. It said, such a waste of time. Come with me on the highway to hell. And, oh, my, my heart just, just broke. It was like, oh, God, this poor man. He's so lost. He's so lost to think that way. Amen. God is God. God is God, and He reigns. He reigns. Are you letting God reign over your life? Are you worrying and fretting about the future? Are you, are you just living in that discontent life? I want us to all come up front right now. I want us to all come up. Don't everybody break a leg to come up. Come on up. 
because I spoke something today that spoke to every single one of you. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Stop fretting, stop worrying, stop being living in disappointment, in fear and anxiety, but start settling contentment in your heart with God. Amen? Lord, let's just pray together right now. Lord, we have spoken your word today. God, we have spoken truth today, Lord, to every person that has been here and heard it today. God, we understand that godliness, Lord, is the opposite of discontentment. And too often in our Christian walk, Lord, we walk and we wake up in discontentment. We go to bed in discontentment, unhappy, Lord. It leads to unholiness, God. It leads to frustration, Lord. God, I pray this morning for everyone, God, here today, Lord, 